startle you. I'm just doing a rebel yell here to kind of kick the Stan Freeberg show off. You know what I mean? There's yellow rose in Texas that I am going to see. Nobody else could miss her, not half as much as me. I cried so when I said, excuse me. That, that's just a shade loud on the snare drum. Hold it, I'll say. Wait, wait a minute, what's all the noise about? Who are you? I'm Stan Freeberg. Well, how can that be? I mean, I'm Stan Freeberg. Well, I mean to say I'm the recorded Stan Freeberg, you know. Well, I'm the live Stan Freeberg, and I'll thank you to get back on the record, will well, you? Listen, you what? smart aleck Yankee. What do you mean, you... smart aleck Yankee? Be quiet, Freeberg, you will you? You be quiet, Freeberg. I appreciate it. Yeah, but listen, what... Hey, oh. Hey, oh. <laughs> listen, you keep out of this, will you? You're on another record. Okay, hold it, hold it, you guys. Wait a minute, who are you? My name is St. George. I'm a knight. No, no, not you. I mean, the, the, other, the other guy. I told you, I'm Stan Freebird. Not you, I mean all these other people. We're, We're all Stan, Stan Freebird. Frightened, frightened. <laughs> people, people, people. People, we've forgotten something. We forgot to open the show. This is the first show of the series of the brand new radio series. From Hollywood, we present the Stan Freeberg Show. With the music of Billy May. Plus the songs of Peggy Taylor with Dawes Butler, June Foray, Peter Leeds, and Judd Conlon, Rhythm Airs. You may not find us on your TV. Because in case you did not know, we're being brought to you on, brought to you on, brought to you on our ABI. Thank you very much. Well, it took so long to open the show that it's just time to say thank you for being with us and good night, everybody! <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. But it's great to be with you tonight. We have a uh, special... Pardon me, Mr. Freeberg, but my name is Tweedley. Well, we all have our problems. <laughs> I am the censor from the Citizens Radio Committee, and uh, I feel... You, uh, from the Citizens Radio Committee, you say? That's exactly what I said, yes. Mm -hmm. And what, I, is your, what is your purpose in being here? I must okay all the material used on your program here. And I think the best method is to just sit back here and interrupt when I feel it's necessary. You mean you plan to stop me every time I do something that you think is wrong? Exactly. I'll just sound my little horn like this. <laughs> and then you stop and I'll tell you what's wrong. Uh, somehow I can tell this is going to be one of those days. <laughs> you just go right ahead, Mr. Freeberg. Don't mind me. Yeah. Now I'd like to sing... <laughs> you forgot to say thank you, Mr. Freeberg. <laughs> Politeness is an essential in radio programming. Your program goes into the home. We must be a good influence on children. And that's a darling little horn there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Mr. Tweedley. You're welcome, I'm sure. I'd like to sing a Old River song in honor this week of National Mississippi Riverboat Paddle Wheel Week. <laughs> Mr. May, if you please. Very polite, Mr. Freeburn. Thank you. <clears throat> old Man River, that old... <laughs> All right, Tweedley, politeness I dig, but what in the world is wrong with Old Man River? The word old has a connotation some of the more elderly people find distasteful. I would suggest you make the substitution, please. I suppose you insist? Precisely. You may continue. Okay, music. You forgot to say, say thank, thank you. you. Yes, okay. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Tweedley. You're quite welcome, I am sure. Elderly man river, that elderly man river, he must know something. But he don't say nothing. All right, hold it, fellas. Now what, Tweedley? The word something, you left off the G. <laughs> but that's authentic. Something. Something. That's the way the people I'm uh, sorry. talk uh, down there. What? The home is a classroom, Mr. Freeberg. I know you said that. Keep in mind the tiny tots. <laughs> and 
Uh, furthermore, think back. You'll recall that you said, but he don't say nothing. Mm -hmm. Now, really, Mr. Freeberg, that's a double negative. Do you mean he does say something? No, I just wasn't using my head, I guess. <laughs> I mean, after all, it should be grammatically correct, keeping in mind... mind the tiny tot, yes. You probably mean he doesn't say anything. I, I, I suppose I mean that, yes, I guess. <laughs> All right, uh, fine, you win. All right, Billy, music. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, I am sure. Elderly man river, that elderly man river, he must know something, but he doesn't say anything. He just keeps rolling, rolling. He just keeps rolling along. He don't doesn't plant taters, potatoes, he doesn't plant cotton, cotting, and them, these, those that plants them are soon forgotten. But every man river, just keep rolling along. Excellent. Tiny tots again, was it? Exactly. Sorry about that. Here we go. <clears throat> you and I, we sweat, crack, perspire, and strain. Bodies all waking and wreck with pain. Oh, we got by that one. Hold that part. Lift that feel. You get a little. Take your finger off the button, Mr. Tweedley. We know when we're licked. <laughs> well, that concludes Elderly Man River. Oh, yes, and thank you for being with us, Mr. Tweedley. You're welcome, I'm sure. <laughs> thank you. And uh, with that, we turn to our celebrated discussion program, Face the Funnies. Peter? Our panel of experts are with us once again tonight. Mr. G.L. Spoon, Miss Edna St. Louis, Missouri, <laughs> and Dr. Linus Quoit. I'm your moderator, Fulbrook Mason. Now to meet the panelists, first of all, Dr. Quoit, I believe you received your doctor's degree at MIT. Uh, what was your field? <clears throat> I received my doctor's degree in Little Orphan Annie. Uh, that was my major. Uh, my minor was Little Abner. <laughs> Next, Miss Edna St. Louis, Missouri, who received her master's degree in Tarzan. Yes, the uh, subject of my thesis for my master's degree was Tarzan and the Apes and his uh, influence on the 20th century culture. Mm, all right. Good. <laughs> yes. Now our third panelist, G.L. Spoon, a, a roving reporter. And you covered the comic strips, didn't you? Uh, that's right. The funnies are my beat, yeah. And what school did you attend? Well, uh, I didn't attend any school as such. Uh, let's just say I'm from the school of hard knocks. That's not original, but it's very apt. I, I see. I uh, may not have any doctor's degrees like some other people around here, but uh, I'll go on the $64,000 question anytime with my subject. And that is? Dick Tracy. Uh, I don't see any reason to go around here with a chip on your shoulder, Mr. Spoon. Look, I haven't got any chip on my have, shoulder. You have a chip on your shoulder. It's I do obvious. Not, I do not have a chip on my shoulder, Dr. Coyd. I don't have to go to college to learn about Dick Tracy. Uh, uh, all right, well, gentlemen, 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 that, gentlemen if you have anything to say, would you? Uh, please, please raise your hand. Uh, please raise your hand. I raise now you? then, the uh, first question today is sent in by a listener is... Uh, uh, why doesn't Tarzan do as much swinging as he used to? <laughs> Dr. Coit? Too old for it. Oh, no. no. Wait a minute, Doctor. Tarzan's my subject. Furthermore, he's not too old. It's Man just... is too old. No, no, no. no. It's, it's just that his vines aren't so good as they used to be. <laughs> Look, uh, uh, actually, I think we can dispense with that vine stuff, Miss Missouri. We all know that he uses ropes. Oh, wait a minute. He doesn't use ropes? I guess I ought to know. Finds the ropes. The fact is, a 72-year-old man is not going to go swinging across the ravine. I mean, uh, Sweetheart, you don't know. Speaking of people's ages, I don't uh, think little orphan Annie will ever see 45 again at this point. Wait, wait, wait. Now, she's getting a little senile. I mean, I know 
notice that in her dialogue balloons. A little senile, eh? Yeah. Well, I, I think the way she's handling those criminals in the canyon there, it doesn't look like the work of an old lady, does it? Yeah. Oh, well, well, all right, no, no, let's, let's, I don't uh, think that's an old lady. Uh, yes, uh, 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 we get on to the next. Whip those criminals. But she's a nice old lady. Could we please uh, <laughs> have anything? Carl is eight years old. I know. We, we got on to the next question. I think we have completed that question. She dyes her hair. She got yes, a red wig. She dyes her hair. Oh, you're a real card tonight, aren't you? Yes, you know. That one. Uh, Mr. Spoon, did you have your hand up? I certainly did. In oh. fact, it went to sleep. Oh. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about criminals here. I think we should leave that to the Dick Tracy expert. Oh, that's it. That's a wonderful idea. All right, now here's our next question. Is Morin Plenty really guilty of the triple murder? Now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> Never mind that. The it's thing... dull stuff. Dull. What do you mean, dull? dull. <laughs> Not dull. dull. Let's talk about some of the orphan anti characters. Punjab, for instance. Now there's a man. Oh, Punjab. Punjab. It sounds what like a misprint. Phony, that mm. Punjab. Could he drop a leopard with a four-inch letter opener? Listen, he just drop his cloak it. over the leopard. Wait a minute, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, Turf. wait a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I got my one, hand up, I got my... One, one at a time. Uh, 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 Look, uh, phone, please. I was you not... got your hand up, go ahead. All right, I... Uh, uh, you don't, you don't... Uh, listen, uh, uh, your hand's still, still asleep. Will you let me talk? I'll have to learn the language all over again. Listen. Well, the the next question, I subject, is wardrobe. Wardrobe. Yes, wardrobe. Does or does not Orphan Annie have more than one red dress? <laughs> oh, Dr. Coy's hand shot up. You're first. Ah, uh, yes. The man who has uh, received his doctor's degree in Little Orphan Annie. Mm -hmm. You have got to keep rubbing that in, don't you? I'm not rubbing uh, it in, sir. I'm merely stating a fact. Okay. I have a doctor's right, degree. Uh, 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 Dr. Coy had his yep. hand, you know, up at the All right, yeah. Hand. Hand. When he was a little kid, he was a little fat, spoiled kid. I can tell the type. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, sir, would you want to step outside? Just get up and 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 uh, yes, some sir. of our lesser educated people here. Uh, that, 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 uh, he didn't mean that. I, I, I happen to know. Or not, I gotta take a poke at him. No, no, I, let's, no, no fight. May I please? Dr. I happen to know that Orphan Annie has a whole closet full of dresses. It's not the same dress. She changes them daily. Daily? Oh, please! <laughs> I can recognize the same dress day in and day out. Madam, they are different. They are different dresses. That is a fact. Take it from me. That's my subject. <laughs> she breaks him up with a nice little blue sweater and chic belt and scarf every once in a while. Well, then how does she break up those chic little white cotton stockings? Wait a minute. she hasn't changed those stockings in 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I take that as a personal affront, sir. A That's personal affront. I intended it as so. Even if it were the same pair of stockings, I think Annie would rinse them out every night. <laughs> it's so like her. It's so like her. Oh, so like her. <laughs> He rinses them out. Take it from them. Well, I hold it. She can put her shoes in. Listen, madam, you should look that good in white cotton stockings. <laughs> Rinse or unrinsed? Hey, uh, White, that Daddy Warbucks is a pretty wealthy guy, right? <laughs> Only one of the top billionaires in the world, that's all. <laughs> that's all. Well, then why doesn't he spring for a few bucks and get her a home permanent? <laughs> A rat's nest, eh? Hey, listen, madam, I noticed the Marcel has gone out of Tarzan's hair lately. <laughs> well, he touched Are you the kidding? fingernails, uh, yes. Well, listen, he's wearing a hairpiece. Just, just, just serves him right, the big jerk. Uh, oh, no, just... Oh, no, listen here, Dr. Listen, White Stockings. Uh, you insulted a little more than any... Let's get home, people. Uh, people, uh, uh, our time uh, bring is up Sandy tonight. Bring Sandy that's all. One of the great animals of our time. Yes, it is, I'm very sure. And that's a museum. Yes, thank you, people. And that concludes another episode of our panel show, Face the Funnies. Now, it's good night to Mr. G.L. Spoon. If vandals kidnap you, look for fingerprints on or about your person. That's a crime stopper. <laughs> oh, indeed it is. And Dr. Linus Coit? Yai. Arf, arf. Glorioski, it's been grand being here. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> finally, Mrs. Edna St. Louis, Missouri. Me, panelist, you, moderator. <laughs> <laughs> And so it's good night until next week. Now we come to the variety portion of our program. Oh, well, what's that going to be, Stan? You like acrobats, Peggy? Oh, yes, I sure do. Good. At this time, I'd like to present for the first time on radio, the Zazaloff family. Zazaloff? 
What nationality is that? Swiss. This way we don't offend anyone. Good. After 11 times on the Ed Sullivan Show, and what with the circus out of business, there was no plate sales for them to go. Ladies and gentlemen, the Zazaloff family! Honest, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you could see this. They're building a human pyramid of bodies. Whoa, there he is up in the air. Look at that. He's hanging by one. How do you like that guy? Acrobats on radio. I rather enjoyed it, Sylvan. Velma, maybe you're not well. Do you mind if I hear the Freeberg program? Oh, Velma. Come on. We probably missed his version of My Fair Lady or something. Yeah, that'll be the day. We probably missed some interesting thing like the discussion on projected hoe handle production for fiscal year 56-57. Don't be ridiculous. Turn him on. Oh, all right. Certainly want to thank you, Mr. Armstead Frag, for coming up here and giving us your views on projected hoe handle production <laughs> for fiscal year 56-57. Oh, thank you, Mr. Freeberg. The pleasure was mine. <laughs> This fall, there will come galloping onto your TV screen the greatest array of Western characters since Smiley Burnett was on This Is Your Life. <laughs> Allow us to be the first to give you a composite preview of these thrilling, action-packed sagas of the West. Just shut your eyes now, and you will hear a typical soundtrack that will be coming out of your television set this fall. No peeking at the picture now. <laughs> of America presents Bang Gunley, U.S. Marshal Fields. spread. Okay. Somebody sure cut through that fence, all right. <laughs> yep. Somebody sure cut through that fence, all right. <laughs> Come on, foreman. Let's get on back to the ranch. Okay. to our action-packed story in just a moment, folks. But first, a word from the newest member of the Eating Corporation of America's breakfast family, Puffed Grass. Puffed Grass, eat Puffed Grass. Chock full of vitamins and chlorophyll, too. What's good for Bossy? Mm. It's good for me and you. Puffed Grass! Hi, boys and girls. This is Jet Crash. 
I'm a test pilot. <laughs> Believe you me, I couldn't break through the sound barrier every morning. <laughs> if I didn't start off my day with a stomach. Full of puffed grass. <laughs> One hundred million cows can't be wrong. <laughs> the only breakfast food containing chlorophyll. Two. <laughs> yes, when us test pilots are all alone up there, pulling out of a sonic dive on the verge of blacking out, with they pull off nine G's on our body, I can't tell you what a comfort it is to have that extra chlorophyll protection. <laughs> Two. It well makes me the most popular test pilot of the annual Lockheed prom. Yes, you can spot the puffed grass eaters in any crowd. They got a green mouth. Goes a boy with a green mouth. He's a puff grass eater. Puff grass. Now back to Bang Gunley, U.S. Marshall Fields. Yeah, boy. Good. Well, let's us tie in the feed bag, eh, Foreman? Okay. <laughs> One thing about you, Ma, you sure womp up a mess of vittles. Foreman and I rode out there this morning. Oh! Well, uh, tell us, new foreman, what do you think? <laughs> well, ma'am, it looks to me like I'm gonna sure cut through that fence, all right? <laughs> Back to our action-packed saga of the old western, just a minute, folks. But first... Good evening. I'm your friendly research chemist here at Eating Corporation of America. You may be interested in learning the painstaking research that went into the discovery of puffed grass. One day, our nearsighted gardener here at the factory took some clippings from the lawnmower and, mistaking it for the incinerator, threw them down the barrel of one of our puffed oat guns. The result, puffed grass. <laughs> yes, science is always working for you at the Eating Corporation of America. <laughs> Today, puffed grass is shot out of six guns, just like the one Bang Gunley uses. Every morning at the factory, I take a gun, a breakfast dish, and shoot myself a bowl of puffed grass. <laughs> of course, a cast iron bowl helps. <laughs> But the goodness is there in every blade. One hundred million moo cows can't be wrong. What's good for Bossy? Mm. Is good for me and you. Puff grass! Now, back to our thrill pack story. Well, Foreman, we just can't thank you enough. What for? Why, for, you know, agreeing with me that, that it sure looked like someone had sure cut through that fence, all right. <laughs> just part of my job as Bang Gunley, U.S. Marshal Fields. 
By thunder. <laughs> I knowed I'd seen you somewhere before. Mr. Gunley, does this... Well, does this mean you, you won't be staying on as our new foreman? Afraid not, Miss Judy. My work is finished here. <laughs> oh, sakes alive! I got a pie in the oven. Oh, uh, come on, Pa. Let's leave these young folks alone. Uh, <clears throat> oh, I uh, didn't... <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gunley? Ma'am? A penny for your thoughts. Well, uh... Miss Judy, I, not much of a talker around women folks, but I've been thinking lately, and, well, now I'm sure. Come here. Yes. Miss Judy, somebody sure cut through that fence, all right. <laughs> well, <clears throat> come on, Pedro. See, si, amigo. <laughs> We leave mucho pronto, eh? What? Well, where did he come from? Pedro, he materializes at the end of each episode. <laughs> Pedro, is he Mexican? No, senorita. Swiss. <laughs> this way, we don't offend nobody. <laughs> Adios. Goodbye, Miss Judy. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> West Marshall Field, riding east, west, north, and south. You can tell he stands for justice by the way he draws a gun and the proud look about his green mouth. <laughs> Uh, yes? Uh, the sheep have arrived. Oh, good. So I hear. <clears throat> From week to week, we will be bringing you, let us uh, just say, rather unusual guest attractions, including an interview with the abominable snowman, uh, blueprints for a build-it-yourself swamp, <laughs> and 3D stereopticon slides of the Johnstown flood with the original cast. <laughs> Today, however, in honor of Bastille Day, we bring you direct from the Basque region of France, uh, Monsieur Marcel Toulet and his original tuned sheep chorus are due to a linguistical barrier. Monsieur Toulet's friend, uh, Mr. Devereux, I believe it is, will interpret uh, for us. Is that uh, right, sir? Monsieur, <laughs> it's a great pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, the pleasure is ours, Mr. Uh, Devereux. Devereux. Uh, ask your friend, if you will, please, uh, what kind of sheep uh, these are? Monsieur Toulet. L'enverrige tonron et le regardou. Il sait gray ones. I see. Well, I, what are the little bells tied around the sheep's neck? I noticed that. Will you ask him what they are for? Uh, Monsieur Toulet. L'ont avisé la poxie de vendre le ding 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 ding. What? Et le regardou. Il sait. A lot of sheep have bells, but these sheep are tuned. Says to make the chromatic scales, which he make use of by knocking the sheep on the head with his crook, a signal to them to ring the bell. He do it like this. In this manner, he can play different songs. Well, that's very nice. I suppose he's going to play a little uh, <laughs> Ba Ba Black Sheep for us or <laughs> something equally as appropriate. I ask him, Monsieur Toulet. Dilamente perrasseux, Baba Black Sheep. Je t'aime, Beredu. Oh, he is very offended, monsieur. Yes, sounded that. He says these sheep play only cool jazz, man. Well, tell him on uh, behalf of radio, I certainly didn't want to put down his sheep, but the. Uh... 
He say, never mind, this no job. Just get on with it. I see. Well, tell him, okay. Come and say. Uh, that means start. Oh, that's very nice. Monsieur et madame. <laughs> Come and say. No, 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 Pierre, no, no, no. Henry, Henry, no, 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 no. Eh, eh, le projet de Bédantra. Eh, le projet de Bédantra. Eh, eh, non, oui, oui. Là, Pierre, tu vois. Le projet de Bédantra. Well, well, thank you very much. So much for the tune sheep. Gee, it was worth all the trouble we went to. We uh, had a little jurisdictional dispute between the American Federation of Musicians and the 4-H Club. <laughs> Seriously, it is our plan to give occasionally on this series what I call, simply for want of a better title, Freeberg's Fables. Tonight we present our first one. Please remember that it is only a fable, and any resemblance between the city we depict and any real Nevada city is purely coincidental. Ladies and gentlemen, we present Incident at Los Varosis. was a mighty city and she worshipped a silver bird the dice were rolling and the living was high when that certain incident occurred it was 1960 when the incident occurred that's almost 10 years ago we feel it only fitting on the anniversary of the incident that we go back and reconstruct for you the events that led up to it. It all started with a notorious rivalry between the two famous Los Varosis nightclubs, the El Sodom and the Rancho Gamora. <laughs> Perhaps you recall the publicity. Early in 1960, the feud got pretty hot when the El Sodom owner, Sam Mohammed, opened his new club with an unusually lavish review. The usual line of chorus girls opened the show with all 386 teeth gleaming. We are the girls of the new El Sodom. Just look at us strut. Whee! Hope you came here with a lot of money to lose at the tables. But if you didn't, we will loan you a G and take a second mortgage on your family. We are the girls of the new El Sodom. Hey, we got the Whee! Following this tender opening was quite a musical extravaganza. They had borrowed the 120 Radio City Music Hall Rockettes, had 119 costume changes, and featured Fats Domino on the contrabassoon. They were doing Rock Around Romeo and Juliet, and business was booming. What light through yonder window breaks <laughs> It is the east And Juliet is the sun Romeo, where the heck are they? Oh, Romeo, where the heck are they? Well, I fear and of course I dig your balcony Our love 
has left its mark on me. My heart bears it just like the Marlboro Man's tattoo. <laughs> surely meant to be my heart wears it laced up just like a blue suede shoe rock 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 around Tchaikovsky rock 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 around Shakespeare if we're shocking you here wow. next week we do the hot king Lear. wherefore art thou my Romeo if you dig me come on and go man go me Hiya, Nevi. Boy, rock around Romeo and Juliet is really packing them in, huh? 25,000 people this show. Yeah, yeah, but Ah, listen. later, later. I want to catch the rest of the show. That new kid, Peggy Taylor, sings good, huh? Yeah, good. But Mr. Mohammed, the Rancho Gamora. Well, what about the Rancho Gamora? The book on the World Orchestra. The World Orchestra? Boy, that sounds good. <laughs> And it was big, very big. The string section featured Yasha Heifetz, Yehudi Menuhin, the Budapest String Quartet, and Jack Benny. <laughs> on guitars, Les Paul, Andre Segovia, and Elvis Presley. <laughs> on horns, the entire brass section of the New York Philharmonic, plus Shorty Rogers and Wingy Manone. At the quadruple keyboards, Arthur Rubenstein, Joe Fingers Carr, Liberace, and Harry Truman. Oh, yes, with Lawrence Welk on accordion. <laughs> the whole thing, of course, was under the baton of Ina Ray Hutton. <laughs> the fact that the World Orchestra et al. was such a smash hit that the Rancho Gomorrah had to tear out the walls to seat 50,000 more people did not go unnoticed back at the El Sodom. Sam Mohammed and his sidekick, Nebi Knezer, had the biggest scheme afoot yet. The El Sodom finished the largest swimming pool in the world in record time. It was so large, in fact, an embarrassing number of guests perished trying to reach the other side. <laughs> and it was only when the club realized that their cash customers were being lost at sea or rather lost at pool, <laughs> that they thoughtfully installed helicopter lifeguard service. <laughs> but the best was yet to come. Nebby, Nebby, I want a press conference in one hour. Uh, what is it, boss? Get all the wire services here. This is it. Florence Chadwick says she definitely will attempt to swim the pool. <laughs> Well, the great day is here. There are more than 300,000 people lining the banks of the El Sodom pool, where any second now the, the very great uh, Florence Chadwick will attempt. Uh, and there she goes, there she goes. She has just entered the water, and that's all from here for now. Take it away, Fred Norwalk, in helicopter number one. Hey, Fred Norwalk here. We can't quite see Miss Chadwick. We can, however, make out the Coast Guard cutters that are escorting her. Folks, I tell you, the view from here is really something. The magnificent Nevada scenery, the glorious sunlight reflecting off the slot machines lining the entire banks of the El Sodom pool placed there for the convenience of the spectators. Also alternating between the slot machines are telescopes, through which the customers may get a free look at Miss Chadwick every single time they hit the jackpot. Oh, um, that noise you hear in the background is a slot machine here in the helicopter being operated by our pilot, George Snoozov. I, um, I still can't quite make out Miss Chadwick. Perhaps if we can get Jim Ryan over in helicopter number two to come in. He's flying at a lower altitude. Thank you, Fred Norwalk. Jim Ryan here in helicopter number two. Will you hold down the slot machine there, Perry? Thank you. I can't see Miss Chadwick too well, but we sure got a beautiful view of the now famous floating crap games. <laughs> We're going to switch you over to helicopter number three, our television plane. Perhaps they, through the miracle of electronics, can see Miss Chadwick. I know they're really way up there, so come in, wings badly, in helicopter number three. 
Wings Badley here in helicopter number three. We are really up here. I think we are as high as man has gone in a helicopter. Hope you can read me clearly as I am talking through my oxygen mask. Uh, George, can you switch on the telescopic lens yet on the camera? No? Well, keep trying. <laughs> And so it went. It was quite a day at the El Sodom, and a good time was had by all, except, of course, at the Rancho Gomorra. Oh, incidentally, Miss Chadwick didn't make it. <laughs> it was flatly denied by the Rancho Gomorra boys that they had tampered with their hot, nourishing broth. Well, Gruna, baby, you did such a good job tampering with Miss Chadwick's hot, nourishing broth that we are thinking of giving you a raise. Well, gee, thanks, Mr. Belchazza. You can call me Lou. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Lou. Hey, boss, boss. Yeah, Flack. I, I got it all set up. Uh, we're going to make that Chadwick thing at the El Sodom look like a Sunday school picnic. Did you set the deal? <laughs> you said it. What's the pitch, Flack? What are we booking in? The 1960 presidential inauguration on stage. Twice a night. They understand that, don't they? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's in the deal. Okay. What do we call the show? The Inaugurities of 1960. <laughs> what a title. Um, have you got the uh, choreography worked out? Yeah. Get a load of this. Two lines of girls. Big, you know. Yeah. One line I got in Supreme Court justice robes. The other line is dressed in scanty versions of the suit the president will wear. Oh, gee, that's great. They all have their left hands on copies of the Nevada phone books and their right hands raised in the air like they're swearing in. Except they ain't swearing in, they're trucking on down. <laughs> Booking the inaugural was a stroke of genius. And what with coming on stage twice a night and being held over for eight weeks, this president was inaugurated more times than Franklin Delano Roosevelt. <laughs> no show ever opened without critics, however, and there were a few. Luella Parsons took a dim view of the proceedings. They seated her behind a post. <laughs> Back at the El Sodom, however, they took a dimmer view than Miss Parsons. Sam Mohammed, the El Sodom owner, was livid. If those bums at the Rancho Gamora think Sam Mohammed is going to take this lion down, they're out of their skulls. We aren't whipped yet. Yeah, but boss, we, uh, I mean, we're doing good business. I put in a well twice a night in the pool. Oh, certainly. <laughs> but we're going to go bigger than that. Oh, what could be bigger than that? Plenty. Now, hand me those papers there, Nabby, huh? Now, what's the biggest thing in the headlines? Now, let's see. Eh, this is it, right here. Why, why, there's... There's nothing there but the Suez Crisis. Well, that's it. We're going to book the Gaza Strip. <laughs> Boss, um, I mean, uh, w we're gonna move the club to the Gaza Strip? Nebby, my boy, you missed the point. Sam Mohammed doesn't have to go to the Gaza Strip. Here's a flash. The Gaza Strip is coming to Mohammed. <laughs> Sam Mohammed, Las Ferocis, Nevada's gambling biggie, uh, has booked an international incident into his plush nightery, uh, the El Sodom. He is flying in by continuous airlift, three quarters of a mile of the Gaza Strip, complete with soldiers and implements of war. <laughs> Yes, they cut it into hundred-foot sections and numbered the sections the way William Randolph Hearst used to move great treasures of art to San Simeon. The picture of a hundred-foot section of sand with 14 Egyptian soldiers wearing full battle dress and bewildered looks being snatched off to Nevada <laughs> made the cover of life. And when it was pointed out to Sam Muhammad that the booking of a war into Los Verosis would cause many people to lose their lives... He replied, People are gonna have wars anyway. Why blame me? <laughs> <laughs> and 
And on that philosophical note, the Gaza Strip was reassembled in the new Suez Room. <laughs> built to accommodate three quarters of a million people in addition to the battle area. For the convenience of the soldiers, Sam placed crap tables, slot machines, and roulette wheels right between the front lines. <laughs> you couldn't say Sam Muhammad wasn't a thoughtful man. You couldn't say he wasn't shrewd either. Just as protection in case the international incident was rained out, he had some interesting added attractions. In the lounge, a rare phonograph record of Adolf Hitler singing, I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. <laughs> And in the garage, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre with the original cast. <laughs> now, you wouldn't book an international incident on stage complete with two armies, count them, two, and live ammunition without a chorus line and original music. And neither would Sam. <laughs> Life for a chorus girl isn't easy to begin with, but there were extracurricular hazards for the El Sodom girls, including jumping in and out of foxholes gracefully and tap dancing on sand. <laughs> Due to unanticipated expenses, the El Sodom went over their budget. There was quite a turnover in dealers who had been forced to work the tables in no man's land. <laughs> All in all, 228 dealers, croupiers, and shills bit the felt. <laughs> but so it wasn't a total loss. They sold the screen rights to Universal International with a tentative title, They Died With Their Eye Shades On. <laughs> if you think the fellows at the Rancho Gomorra were taking this lying down, they were by the pool. Rub a little bit of that suntan oil between my shoulder blades, will you, Gruner, baby? I got delicate skin. <laughs> sure thing, Mr. Belshazzar. Say, if you don't mind me saying so, you're taking this pretty calm for a man who just lost a quarter of a million people to the El Sodom. Boss, bo boss, boss, I got it. Got what? The way we can top the El Sodom. So you got it all worked out, huh? Well, that's nice. Well, look, I mean, booking the Gaza Strip hurt the El Sodom in the long run. The war got a bad press. It did a pretty good business. They packed them in. Yeah, but the newspapers criticized them for booking a war. So, here's the way I figure it. We'll pull the big switch and book peace. It'll be a smash. Look, I can see the headlines in Variety now. Peace, powerful box office, may start trend. Gee, Mr. Belshazzar, that sounds great. Shut up, Gruner, baby. <laughs> Listen, Flack, when I want your ideas, I'll ask for them. But, boss, you didn't let me finish. We'll, we'll book a summit conference. We'll build our own summit. Okay, what do we put on the top of the summit? Well... Oh, I can see it now. We arrange some chairs in a sort of semicircle. Then you know what we do? We book in the world leaders to sit in them. Yeah, and in between the chairs, we put special slot machines that'll uh, take, like, oh, francs, rubles, pounds, yen. Sit down, sit down, Gruner, baby. We ain't gonna do it. Why, Why not? not? Because they booked one into Geneva and it laid an egg. <laughs> <laughs> so we... We ain't gonna book peace. We can't take a chance on it. We're only gonna go for a sure thing at the box office. Well, what are we gonna do? I'll tell you what you're gonna do. You're gonna tear out the walls and make room for one million people. I'm through playing games with the El Sodom. I've been saving this for my Sunday punch. Some Sunday punch. It was bigger than Los Ferrosis had imagined in their wildest dreams. And when the boys at the El Sodom saw the 500-foot neon sign go up at the Rancho Gomorrah, they could hardly believe it. 
The sign read, for all the world to see. The Rancho Gamora proudly presents, for one time only, on stage, the Hydrogen Bomb. <laughs> Yes, everybody who thought he was anybody was there that night. In fact, there were more than a million people in the room when the gigantic machinery rolled back the roof and the great spotlight slowly slithered up the silver tower until it came to rest on that grim spectral object. I wonder if the boys were still counting their profits when time ran out and the man pushed the button. Los Barosi was a golden city as the history writers all have penned but her days were numbered in that heavenly book and she pushed her own button in the end So concludes our fable, Incident at Los Verosis. And we'd really love to receive your comments. Sometime soon we'll do another fable for you. Meanwhile, we'll all be back next week with, of all things, an interview with the abominable snowman, the inside story of the midnight ride of Paul Revere, and for you music lovers, the real lowdown on hi-fi in honor of Deafen Your Neighbors Week. <laughs> Plus uh, the, oh yes, the Lox Audio Theater with a stirring psychological drama entitled Kick Me Tender. <laughs> so until next week then, this is Stan Freeberg saying thanks for listening, God bless you, and good night.